Hello there, my fellow lycanthropes, and welcome back to another episode from our Mythical Creatures lore series. I know Halloween has just passed, as today is November 1st, but I still wanted to make another creature feature themed around it. And I am fairly confident that most of you will enjoy this topic, as it is, after all, one of the most famous monsters in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the werewolf. Now, I will be the first one to agree that there are enough origin stories and adaptations in all sort of media that if I were to actually make a detailed account, it would take me a dozen episodes. So, instead, I will make an overview of what werewolves are, what they are like, some possible origins of the myth, and a few more explanations that are more reasonable. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Pretty much since the dawn of civilization, the moon, and especially the full moon, has long been seen as a cause of strange shifting in human behavior. However, one of the most famous such changes is the one associated with werewolf transformation. The werewolves have been part of European folklore for centuries, but they did catch on in popularity when citizens were put on trial for so-called wolf charming and lycanthropy in the later part of the Middle Ages. A werewolf is a man who has been cursed or charmed into a monster that hunts at night and craves human flesh. The word werewolf itself literally translates to man-wolf or wolf-man, if you will. There are many ways in which this transformation can occur. Legends claim that a man could transform into a wolf if he was bitten or scratched by another werewolf while in animal form. There are also accounts of children who were cursed to hunt as werewolves if they grew up in an abusive home. There are records of people willingly transforming into werewolves. One of the more common claims for being able to transform was for a person to remove all their clothes and wear a belt made of wolfskin or a wolfskin in its entirety. In both cases, the werewolf would need to find their clothing once again to transform back into a human. There are also tales of magic salves that could transform a person. Other sources tell of enchanted streams giving the people the ability to transform. Yet more transformation rituals include drinking rainwater out of the footprint of a wolf and sleeping with the light of a full moon on one's face during a Wednesday or Friday night. With the search for werewolves in the Middle Ages becoming almost as bad as hunting witches, the people began looking for telltale signs that an individual could be a potential werewolf. One of the most common identifiers of a werewolf was a unibrow. Other signs included curved fingernails, lower than normal ears, and a swinging stride resembling that of a wolf. If an unfortunate individual was identified as a potential werewolf, they were often subjected to testing to see if the accusations against them would hold up. One of the most common methods of testing was to cut the skin of the accused and see if there was fur underneath. When werewolves were in their animal form, it is said that there are surprisingly very few differences between the creature and a proper wolf. One of the biggest indicators of a werewolf would be the absence of a tail. It was also believed that werewolves had human eyes and human voices. The easiest way to identify a suspected werewolf, though, was to try and injure the monster itself with a mark that was easily identifiable. It was believed that when a werewolf was injured in animal form, the same injury would register in human form. One of the most common themes of the werewolf is their craving for human flesh. At night, the creatures are said to hunt for victims in order to satisfy their insatiable hunger. There are many different versions and variations of the werewolf, but many of them involve the transformation of a sinner into a wolf. Some sources specify that a person who was guilty of committing a deadly sin would be cursed to turn into a werewolf for seven years at night. Other sources specify that werewolves prefer to eat children, while an equal number says that they choose their victims indiscriminately. Now, at some time or another, you've probably heard the term lycanthrope or lycanthropy. 
it's important to know that these are not the same as the werewolf. The werewolf itself refers to the idea of a person being able to transform themselves into a wolf and assume wolf-like mannerisms. A lycanthrope, on the other hand, is just a person who thinks they have the ability to transform into a wolf or even another animal species. These individuals often have other disturbing symptoms, including psychosis or a strange craving for human flesh. It is believed that some individuals with lycanthropy believe they have the ability to transform into a werewolf because they need some internal justification for their own violent tendencies or even cannibalistic desires. A very infamous case involving a supposed werewolf is that of a guy known as Peter Stump. This poor fellow had the misfortune of having one of the most famous werewolf trials of all time, that is, in 1589. Because the town felt they had enough evidence against him, this was mainly a trial by torture. Stump was connected to the werewolf of Bedburg because of his notable disability, a missing left hand. It was reported that the werewolf of Bedburg also had a missing left paw, and since it was believed that the injuries of a werewolf manifested themselves in both human and wolf form, Stump was quickly charged. The trial commenced with Stump being stretched out on a rack, and having chunks of his flesh ripped out with searing hot pincers. His bones were crushed with stones, to ensure that the great pain was enough to convince him to, air tags, confess. Since torture is known to get a man to confess to pretty much anything, Stump eventually did confess to everything he was being accused of. He alleged that he was practicing black magic since the age of 12, and had been assuming the form of a werewolf for 25 years. During this period, he confessed that he killed both livestock and humans. Most notably, he admitted to killing and eating 14 children and two pregnant women. Aside from all the innocent women and children he supposedly ate, he was also forced to confess to being guilty over having incestuous relationships with his daughter. He confessed to these accusations as well, which resulted in both his daughter and his mistress being executed alongside with him. After the crowd had finally gotten their pound of flesh, he was beheaded and his body, along with his body of the daughter and the mistress, were burned for all to see. Some historians believe that, while this guy was obviously not a werewolf, he was tried by the church as a way to send a message to recently converted Protestants. The guy, Peter Stump, was a recently converted Protestant. A couple of possible inspirations for the myth of the werewolf include... In Greek mythology, there was once upon a time a man named Lycaon who wanted to test Zeus's omniscient ability. To see if Zeus really was all-powerful and all-knowing, Lycaon killed his own son and served his roasted flesh to Zeus himself. Zeus, being, you know, Zeus, knew what Lycaon had done from the get-go, and punished him for this terrible deed by turning him into a wolf. The Ulfhednar. I do hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. These guys were more or less a cult, or sub-faction, if you will, of the infamous Norse berserkers. It is said that they were a group of elite Norse warriors living in the woods as a shamanistic cult. Their patron animal was obviously the wolf, and it was said that the greatest of their number could actually transform into wolves during battle. They were also thought to be immune to iron and fire while fighting. Though the Ulfednar were feared by everyone, including their own families, they were also greatly respected and considered to be the men of Odin. Finally, before I leave you for today, I should also offer you some reasonable explanations of the myth. There are obviously many theories as to what or who may have inspired the myth of the werewolf. Some scholars say that the existence of some wolf-creature mythology was almost unavoidable in Europe, because the wolves were seen as one of the most fearsome predators of the time. Others believe that the fear of werewolf transformation was simply a misinterpretation of a medical condition. There are two main diseases in particular that seem to be reasonable explanations for the stories, porphyria and hypertrichosis. 
Porphyria is a condition that makes its sufferers very sensitive to sunlight, and is characterized by reddish teeth, anxiety, seizures, and psychosis. Supporters of this theory claim that people may have been frightened by these afflicted with porphyria because they would have only been active at night, making them the prime suspects for werewolf transformation. On the other hand, while porphyria does have the expected symptoms of those guilty of werewolf transformation, it doesn't explain why werewolves are described as resembling a wolf in physical form. Instead of porphyria serving as the cause of the alarm, some believe that hypertrichosis is the better candidate. This one is a condition in which the afflicted person has excessive hair growth. This excessive hair could have been why some individuals appeared like werewolves if they were seen at night. Others argued that this isn't it either, because the rarity with which this disease occurs makes it very unlikely that many of them could have existed in the same area at the same time. There are yet other scholars believing that werewolf transformation stories could have arisen from the spread of rabies. The ones supporting this theory see to the point that the victims of rabies can pass the disease to the others if they bite each other. Regardless of how the story actually came to prominence, one thing is still certain. Werewolves still are, and probably will remain, as one of the most infamous folktales to gain popularity around the globe. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the werewolves and their traits for today. I'm sure there is a lot more to be said about them though. Heck, even making a list of movies and series they were in would probably make for an episode by itself. Either way, I do hope you enjoyed even this short overview of this famous monster. Are you a fan of the werewolves? What do you like or dislike most about them? Let us know what your thoughts are on them in the comments below. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. If you want to support this particular series, and I would appreciate it if you do, try to watch the videos when I post them, or as soon as you can, and you can also check the playlist to see if maybe you missed any of the other creature videos. Thank you very much for watching to the end, and I wish you all an awesome day. This is GDN signing off.